Let's see, where's my... Hey, how's everybody? Good morning. Um, uh, thank you all for coming um, <clears throat> to this special, uh, somewhat belated President's Day event. You probably forgot, thought we forgot about President's Day, right? <laughs> we, had to, we had to make sure we had the perfect guests uh, for this event. Uh, there, there really is no more into uh, important topic than uh, the presidency and the Constitution. Uh, so we honor uh, this President's Day with a post-mortem uh, on the historic impeachment of Donald Trump. Now, now it's over, um, the episode is over, but um, there's been this frenzied aftermath of recriminations uh, and executive actions uh, that very, really make very clear that profound questions remain uh, about the state of American democracy uh, and the Constitution. Uh, of special interest uh, is, uh, and concern uh, is uh, the mischiefs of factionalism. Uh, raw and disruptive party conflict, which James Madison feared as the greatest threat uh, to the American Republic. And uh, another question besides just talking about the impeachment and the Constitution we want to take up today is how has uh, this uh, partisan rancor uh, affected the Constitution and the President's accountability to the Constitution? And we could not have had uh, two better people to tackle this topic than Claire Finkelstein and Jonathan Turley. They are both highly distinguished and nationally recognized uh, local scholars. And I'm going to give them brief introductions. They deserve much longer introductions, but that would take up the whole hour. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, Claire is the Algerman Biddle Professor of Law and also the Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, my alma mater. So we're both Quakers. But I was there when Ben Franklin was founding uh, the <laughs> university, so, so Claire uh, has more recent experience. Um, she's also the founder and director of Penn's Law, uh, Penn's, uh, Penn Law's Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law, a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute that seeks to promote the rule of law in modern day conflict, warfare, uh, and national security. Those sound like weighty problems <laughs> to solve. Uh, Claire, I think Claire's teaching and scholarship combines in a way that is all too rare uh, attention to both presidential power and foundational ethical or philosophical questions. And besides running a center that, over, uh, that addresses constitutionalism uh, and, and ethics. She is the co-editor of the Oxford University Press's series in Ethics, National Security, and the Rule of Law, and a volume editor of four titles thus far, right? You haven't put out a fifth? We've got 11 more in the works. 11 course. more. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> um, and the most uh, recent of these volumes is uh, Sovereignty and the New Executive Authority, which was published 2018, right? Uh, Jonathan is the J.B. and Maurice C. Shapiro Professor of Public Interest Law, and he is the Director of the Environmental Law uh, um, Advocacy Center uh, at George Washington uh, University Law School. Uh, and he is, as he has confessed, obsessed with James Madison. It sounds like a good obsession to have. Uh, and he has a long and distinguished career fretting over the growth of presidential power, uh, and, and how it has affected the division and separation of powers that Madison so prized. Uh, he's written widely and deeply about constitutional principles uh, and the hard challenges contemporary presidential politics poses to them. And he has also served as the counsel in some of the most notable cases uh, pertaining to national security uh, and terrorist cases. And he has been named uh, uh, as one of the top uh, 10 lawyers uh, in handling uh, military cases. And I believe you've also been named one of the top Irish attorneys, yeah. right? <laughs> but that's in the top 100, not the top 100. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's more competitive, I guess. Yeah. Um, many of you uh, might know Jonathan from his recent uh, testimony at the uh, Trump impeachment hearings. And in fact, he's one of only two academics to have testified uh, at both the Clinton and the Trump hearings. I think he's a little too young to have testified at Andrew Johnson's hearings. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just missed, we just missed yeah. that. So, J Jonathan, I want to start uh, with your uh, testimony at the Trump hearings. Uh, and I have long uh, considered you uh, um, uh, a, uh, a leading critic 
of uh, the dangers of presidentialism. So I was a little surprised uh, that you testified against the impeachment uh, of Donald Trump. So I thought we could start out by you uh, shedding some light on your testimony and telling us why you did so. And, and then if you want to, you might also comment on whether you have any regrets uh, <laughs> in the aftermath. <laughs> but let's deal, with the, let's deal with the first one first. <laughs> I, the, I was actually somewhat surprised to be asked to testify because they were only allowed one witness and when they called me, I, I, I said, you do, oh, I should, I should mention, by the way, that I'm required under contract, because I work for CBS and BBC, that nothing I'm about, none of the stupid things I'm about to say, I say on behalf of CBS or BBC. <laughs> Whenever I say that before any appearance, you can hear the size of relief in New York and <laughs> London. Um, the, I was surprised I, when they asked me, because I, I said, you do realize I have a long list of columns criticizing the president, and also, um, I also believe that there are grounds to impeach the president. And um, they, they accepted that uh, because the, the, they were more interested, I think, in the point that I was going to make. When I, when I testified uh, in Clinton and Trump, I said a couple of things that are, are, are the same. I said that you do not need a crime to impeach a president. This is where I disagree with Alan Dershowitz. Uh, and in the, um, in the Trump impeachment, I primarily wrote about, I put a pretty extensive written testimony in, criticizing four of the articles of impeachment that were being advanced by the committee. Uh, bribery, extortion, campaign finance, and obstruction of justice. And my point with those was that while you don't need a crime, historically when you allege these types of allegations, you refer to the criminal code, how courts define those crimes, and that brings a certain degree of legitimacy because it's, it's an independent, uh, objective source to determine what this conduct is. And so where I primarily disagreed with my three friends testifying on the other side is they believed that that was not relevant, that you could, in fact, uh, impeach even if it didn't meet those definitions or those cases. Uh, what's ironic is that actually the, the, the judiciary rejected those four articles, and they went forward with the two that I said could be the basis of impeachment, which is uh, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. Now, where we disagreed, and ultimately Nadler ended the hearing by quoting me and saying, Professor Turley says that we actually can impeach on these grounds. Where we disagreed and where I was sort of vehement is that they should not impeach by Christmas. That is, they were rushing this impeachment vote. And I returned to this over and over again saying, you can impeach for abuse of power. It's just very hard. We've never had a sole abuse of power, primary abuse of power impeachment go up against a president. It's usually been in context with collateral crimes. So it's not that you can't do it, a la Alan Dershowitz. It's just that it's hard to do it. And so you need to take a couple of more months, impeach him in April, impeach him in, in, in March perhaps, but get the subpoenas out. Because you know at that point, uh, you had the national security advisor um, who was basically walking outside the Capitol with a sandwich board saying, subpoena me. <laughs> and uh, he, he said he would testify if you subpoenaed him. And, and what I said is, why aren't you issuing a subpoena to John Bolton? In the Nixon case, it took three months to go from the, the subpoena fight in front of Sirica to a final decision in the Supreme Court. Three months. They burned that amount of time before they even started uh, to, to vote. So why not wait until March and April? The worst that's going to happen is you're going to have a stronger case. The, and the best that could happen is you get a Bolton testify. I think you would definitely have two other witnesses testify. You can only have a stronger case. So the choice is, do you rush an impeachment to a guaranteed failure? Because you cannot go to the Senate and say, complete my case for me. They're not going to do it. So why do, what's the rush for Christmas? And to, honestly, after all of this has happened, no one has ever explained to me why. Because I think it was, there were two colossal blunders in this impeachment. The House made an absolute historic blunder in pushing the impeachment by Christmas. And the White House made a historic blunder in building the defense around Alan Dershowitz's theory. And I think both sides made serious blunders. And I think history will not look kindly on either. So do you have any regrets? 
about that testimony given the aftermath? No, the aftermath was hard, but when I was asked, I told the family, because when I testified at Clinton, I said, we're going to get a lot of death threats, because that's what happened in the Clinton case. It's, it, and, I, and it was more severe uh, this time because of social media. There was many more death threats. There was even threats to shoot my dog, and, which I don't understand, because she's no. a golden doodle. And who the hell shoots a golden doodle? I mean, I, I mean a shih tzu, yes, but a who golden doodle. A I, but... Um, <laughs> My other regret is that my two sons, Aiden's here, but my other son, Benjamin, was, was sitting right behind me through the whole testimony. And afterwards, Benjamin got hundreds of date requests. Uh, and I said, you know, something wrong with this. I get hundreds of death threats. You get hundreds of date requests. It just seems this is fundamentally wrong. But uh, that's my only regret. Yeah. Yeah. Claire, I, I know you have some uh, dis disagreements with uh, Jonathan. I know there are some, there's some common ground, but I wonder if you just tell us what your disagreements with Sure. With well, uh, first, let me just say thank you to you, Sid, and to the Miller Center for inviting me here. And it's always a pleasure to uh, be able to spar a little with Jonathan. Um, we are often on uh, National Public Radio together, and I'm always pleased uh, to hear because I know that uh, the views I disagree with will get a, a, a really uh, good run for their money. So, um, so uh, let me just say, I was surprised to find myself actually agreeing with Jonathan on anything here, and, and yet I found I did on one essential point, which is the Democrats made a mistake by rushing this process. Now, the essential point where we disagree is why it was a rush. Jonathan believes, as I understand, that the case was half-baked because the allegations weren't proven. I think anybody watching those 12 witnesses uh, in the House could not come away with anything other than the view that there was a quid pro quo, that the president did try to strong arm President Zelensky uh, into announcing an investigation into his political rival, and that there was an effort to use a foreign power to dig up dirt on uh, Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden. It was very difficult to think that on the facts, the case wasn't proven. However, the case wasn't fully baked politically. And I agree with Jonathan that what we needed was the inner circle, uh, people like John Bolton, Mick Mulvaney, and Don McGahn, to testify either in the House or the Senate. The House had control of the case before it was sent to the Senate, and they gave up that control. Uh, and then immediately mm -hmm. lost it. And I think they regretted it nearly immediately, which explains Nancy Pelosi's decision to withhold the articles of impeachment, hoping that maybe more, you know, since more facts were dribbling out every day, that there might be a possibility of, of getting new witnesses to mm -hmm. testify. Um, but the, um, the real mistake was to focus more on removing this president than on the long-term impact of this impeachment. What they needed to look at is the pushback on presidential and executive authority, which has become more and more and more uh, expansive over the years. So I agree with you know, Jonathan number one from his uh, testimony uh, <laughs> against Bill Clinton. Um, and, uh, and that executive authority needed to be reined in, in critical ways, pursuing the witnesses and pushing back on this president's uh, interference with the process and obstruction of Congress would have been the best thing that the Democrats could have done, both for this case and for the long-term uh, health of our democracy. That, that's let, let, can, I, can I make one follow-up? Sure, sure. Uh, it just um, it, it, as to Jonathan number one, um, <laughs> I, which I can't, can't let go. Um, it, it, this was something that people said after my testimony, and I'm afraid it's. I, I actually, if you look back, whenever the criticism has been valid, I've, I've, I think I have always said, you know, it's a good point, and and sometimes I've actually corrected the things that I've said. My testimony in Clinton was virtually identical to my testimony to Trump to the That's point true. that I could have been charged with self-plagiarism. I actually started with my testimony in Clinton when I wrote, we only had four days. 
basically of writing during over the Thanksgiving holiday. That's how little time we had. And in that time, I wrote about 60 single page pa uh, pages, and I pulled a lot from Clinton. People got to have, should remember what was involved in Clinton. There is a quote that they're using, which I'm afraid is not what people have suggested, which is I talk about it's a dangerous precedent not to impeach Clinton because presidential power will expand to fill this space like a gas. Right. What I was referring to was that the, the big debate we were having in, that, at, in front of the Judiciary Committee with people like Larry Tribe and I, where we really disagreed, is that Tribe argued that, um, that certain crimes are not impeachable and that it has to be a crime related to office. And I vehemently objected to that, and I still do, and I actually brought that up in the mm -hmm. Trump impeachment. That is, a, to me, that is a ludicrous concept that was designed to help Bill Clinton because it doesn't make any sense. You could have Harvey Weinstein as president, abusing every woman in the White House. You're not going to impeach him? Alan Dershowitz says a president could give away Alaska back to the Russians and you couldn't impeach him. I mean, does that track with you? What I was talking about, the danger of expanding executive authority, is that if you adopt this view that a crime has to be related to a presidential function, then presidents will fill that space. That's what I was referring to. And I still believe that the Democrats were dead wrong on Bill Clinton, uh, that that was not an impeachable offense. And, uh, but it's a different issue. Well, Jonathan, I actually agree with you about that. So I think that if, if the president uses his office to have sex with a, an intern uh, working in the White House and then lies to Congress about it. That's a pretty serious offense. But is it as serious as actually doing the thing that the founders were so afraid of, namely inducing a foreign power to assist you with your domestic political run? That is the very thing that Hamilton wrote about in Federalist Paper 75, right? When he said, a, a pres the worry is that Congress will not rein in a president who is power hungry and who is using foreign powers, abusing his office, in effect, he wrote, to reach out to foreign powers to get an advantage. That, the very worry that the framers were concerned about was the thing that Donald Trump was accused of doing. Now, there are different issues here, right? The issue of whether or not you think the charges were proven is one issue. But the question of whether or not this is the sort of thing which, if proven, is the most serious kind of offense that a president can commit, I can't compare that to having uh, sex with a with an intern in the White House and lying to Congress, I, just I, different I, orders of magnitude. I actually don't compare them because I think they're both impeachable. So and it's I like saying it's like saying what do you that. hate the more right. you know bank right. robbery extortion. I'm like right. okay, they're both crimes. I don't care right. that you go to jail for both. And in this case, I think abuse of power is impeachable in in the circumstances right. you just described. And I think that lying, committing perjury, and that was perjury. A federal judge said Bill Clinton committed perjury to a special counsel is obviously impeachable conduct. Um, now, there is an interesting debate, and I don't know how Claire feels about this, and I should say I'm delighted I, to be here with Claire, who I have tremendous respect for. Uh, where I, I'm not even sure where Claire comes out on this, but there is a sort of fascinating debate about what the vote in the Senate means. Uh, you know, there's historically been some confusion among senators whether the vote is simply did you prove an impeachable offense or did you approve a removable offense? And up until, in the first impeachment trial, they actually bifurcated the questions. They actually had two votes. One was, did they prove the case? And the second vote was, is this something we want to remove about? And then with Clinton, it sort of merged, right? So it got all messed up because some people agreed perjury was an impeachable offense, but they didn't want to remove. And this sort of the, the argument that Claire was making. Right, I think it would have been really helpful to have those two separate votes. Because I actually believe that the majority of senators, a few voiced this, but, um, but I think it could have been more widespread, believed that he did it, but didn't believe it was a removable offense. Okay. I mm -hmm. think it would be helpful to have clarity on that. Do, are, are the Republicans in the Senate really prepared to accept that if these charges were proven, it's okay? It's not removable? Because, of course, the, the predictable result is that this precedent is unleashed. He's doing it again. The, we just had uh, very clear reports that the Russians are continuing to interfere uh, with our elections. They interfered with the midterms. 
And now the Senate has, in effect, said, it's OK, right? They didn't say, we need more proof. Because if they had said that, they would have called in the witnesses, right? They wouldn't have blocked that vote on witnesses. So I think they were prepared to say, um, we are ready to live with a president who does something like this. And if this is where our democracy comes out, that it's open season on our elections, that any president can reach out to foreign powers to get assistance uh, with his re-election bid, I think that's a grave concern mm. to our nation. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that <coughs> might have been short of impeachment might have satisfied your concern about some acknowledgment of, what did Lamar Alexander call it, inappropriate behavior, might have been a censure. Might yeah. have been a and censure. that's only happened one time in our history with Jackson. Uh, and the outcome of that wasn't really all that satisfactory in terms of constraining uh, presidential power. But do you think that's uh, an option the Democrats should have considered? Uh, I think that they should have hung on to the case in the House mm -hmm. as long as possible. Um, I think a censure wouldn't have made any difference with this president. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have been embarrassed. He would have, in fact, used it against the Democrats. And I think, like Jonathan, I think the big mistake was to think they had to do this before the election. Mm. Because in fact, if you look at the polls, uh, the public was most against the president and most in favor of the Democrats' case while the testimony was going on. So that testimony actually had an impact. Suppose we had gone into the election with the impeachment case, like a sword of Damocles, hanging over the president's head. <coughs> and saying, you know what, we're going to fight to get these witnesses in. We're going to subpoena John Bolton, Mick Mulvaney. We're going to pursue the subpoena of Don McGahn, which, by the way, won mm -hmm. at the first level. It might have been uh, affirmed on appeal. We might have gotten Supreme Court precedent saying the president cannot use executive privilege to block witnesses. That would have been a really big mm -hmm. win for the rule of law. And have that battle going right into mm. the elections. Yeah. Well, Nancy Pelosi, and you and I, I know, share admiration for her, seems to usually be so good at gaming these things out. Yeah. And perhaps, as you were just suggesting, she made a mistake in, in this case. I think but, she did make a mistake. Yeah. But I'll just add to that. It's understandable that she made this mm. mistake, right? Because what was really going on was the president's obstruction of Congress, the very thing that he was being impeached for was the thing that prevented this case from fully being litigated, mm. right? It was his obstruction, his threat to use executive privilege that had the witnesses all scared to come mm. forward. Yeah. So when you have the very obstruction going on that prevents the witnesses from coming on that he's being impeached for, it's a no-win situation. Mm. I, I, I think there was I think there was a win scenario. Uh, that's where we disagree. I, by the way, I would not suggest holding it past the election. There was ample time to get this impeachment through before the election. And uh, if you look at past impeachments, the courts expedite. Uh, and things move quickly, even for a non-presidential impeachment. You know, I, a, um, Adam Schiff was my opposing counsel in the last impeachment. He and I did the Porteous impeachment. That was the previous impeachment to Trump. Mm -hmm. And we had evidentiary issues that moved, very, even for a judge, moved extremely quickly. We could have gotten, this could have easily been uh, dealt with, and they could have impeached in April, and I think they would have gotten all this testimony. And um, the Supreme Court would have expedited. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a mystery to me why they didn't do it. They would have, I, you know, the funny thing is, in January, before the impeachment, I testified in the House Judiciary. And it, Nadler and I had this interesting exchange where I said, why aren't you voting to approve an impeachment inquiry right now? And why aren't you going to court to force the White House counsel to testify? You will win. I used to represent the House of Representatives. And I said, as, as a former counsel for the House of Representatives, you need to get to court. Bring in the White House counsel. He will lose. Trump will lose. You will get a court do, do order. Think, Jonathan, I got to ask you. You think the Supreme Court would have upheld the McGahn ruling? Well, do you think they were worried about, understandably right. worried about that? Do you think that a court would have said yes, John Bolton? You have to. And by the way, at that time, Bolton was saying. I won't answer a subpoena. Well, he changed time, his no, mind on that. Actually, I, I'm not sure that's true. In my testimony, I actually quote him as saying that he might testify in the House if he was subpoenaed. He had said he that shortly before have. the hearing. And, and I, I raised that and him. said, what do you need? Give the man a subpoena. But you take, know, take I, Mick Mulvaney. Right. Do you think that a, a district court was likely going to say, 
yes, Mick Mulvaney, you have to respond to the subpoena. Maybe. Well, the district court did say that with McGahn, right? So they with won on McGahn. McGahn. That's right. And, 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 and the weird thing is, by the way, they went ahead and they did what I said, not because I said it, but they went ahead and they did go to court on McGahn. And they did win on McGahn. And by the way, Adam was just simply wrong. Adam gave a press conference and said, you know, it took us eight months just to get that ruling. That's not true. It took four months. They actually, and that was without expedition, without an impeachment inquiry, a regular pace. It took four months to get that ruling. I, I agree with you, about, but I think the part you're not factoring in is the president's own interference with the process. That the Democrats felt that we cannot win on these subpoenas because the president is controlling these witnesses and is not going to get but them But that's in. not true. They would win. And every president has opposed it. I mean, my problem is that I, I oppose the president's position on these subpoenas. I think he's dead wrong. I said that in my testimony. I told Congress that they would win. But, but the problem I had with Article 2, when they said that this was obstruction of Congress, is this was the shortest investigation of a presidential impeachment in history. It was the thinnest record to go to a, the Senate in history. And I asked the judiciary, why do you want that distinction when you can control it? Why would you want hey, that? Jonathan, why was it so short? Because, because, because they, they couldn't get in the witnesses. <laughs> no, no, no. That's why it was so short. <laughs> no, they would have been no. delighted to have Don no, McGahn, Mick excuse. Mulvaney, that's, all of those. That, that's an easy excuse. We never have this opportunity in NPR. <laughs> uh, the, um, I think I should have worn my referee <laughs> after. <laughs> <laughs> it sure didn't take well, long, did it? I didn't know sparring, <laughs> you know, when you used the term sparring, you were going to be so uh, no, but literal. No, but, but the reason I, I don't buy that is, look, Bill Clinton and Richard Nixon both were able to go all the way to the Supreme Court and get rulings. They also opposed, Why? Why? They also opposed it. They also made exact privilege. But by the way, Nixon resigned right after losing from the Supreme Court. Clinton threw in the towel after losing from the Supreme Court. And that would have, and because they knew that the weight was against them in terms of those orders. Why not get those orders? Why not improve your you case? Think, if I could just ask a quick follow-up. Do, do you think, given the changes on the Supreme Court and the kind of the growth of this idea of the universal, uh, uni, unitary executive and the new member, newest members of the court, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, are pretty zealous defenders of that theory. Uh, are you sure, are you confident, that had it gone to the Supreme Court, we wouldn't have gotten some uh, serious reversals on U.S. v. Nixon. No, I actually said... And the said executive privilege might have been expanded, sanctified by the court, and things could have been, as Alice in Wonderland said, worser. Well, no, I actually said in my testimony, I said, first of all, I didn't say his testimony, but look, I testified in favor of Gorsuch did, and his yeah. confirmation. And you cannot bet on Gorsuch on this. Uh, Gorsuch is a lot more nuanced than people have suggested he is, and he's proven that. He has voted with the left of the court on critical I, cases I agree with, against I agree administration, with you on that, so you can't guess it. that. Also, Roberts, my guess is that they would win on some aspects, but that would be enough. I think what Claire's, I think Claire's point is a really good one where you talk about, you know, how would they have ruled on, on like, you know, Mulvaney and Bolton. We, we, that is in the land of the unknown. You know, executive privilege is very fluid, mm -hmm. When the court dealt with Nixon, it did not say that a president could not invoke executive privilege in an impeachment. That was misstated by some House members. Um, it said that the invocation in that case was not supported, that they rejected it as unsupportable, but they did not say you can't raise executive privilege. The, um, and the problem is that national security advisor, chief of staff, that's the core of executive privilege. That's what executive privilege the Supreme Court embraced. That's how they defined it. So my guess is that they would win even on Bolton mm -hmm. to some extent. That is, he would have to answer some questions, but they would lose in others. So Jonathan, I really have to, to oppose you on this because <laughs> this is the you core really don't of have it. To. I really have to. Because I, I don't want to think to, about this. He's, he's, Just for the sake of entertainment. He's, he's kinder to me than I am to him because I'm always <laughs> highlighting our disagreements. But I really think this is the essential point. Executive privilege is the essential point here because this is a president who thinks that Article Two of the Constitution allows him to do whatever he wants. He has said that repeatedly. He believes in no constraints on the presidency, and therefore he thinks he's acting perfectly within his right to defy uh, anything that Congress is trying to do with 
with an impeachment proceeding. And unfortunately, that view has become fairly prevalent. So that, as you say, the theory of the unitary executive, as Sid mentioned, um, is a completely different situation now, means that the, that the way that we regard presidential <coughs> power has transformed. And it's that issue that needs to be pushed back on, that theory of the unitary executive. The arguments that, that people made in the impeachment that the president's team made, yourself accepted, absolutely took my breath away to say that um, if Dershowitz's argument that if the president thinks it's in the country's interest for him to be reelected uh, with the help of a foreign power, that makes it okay. See, this it was is an a, unbelievable no, no, argument. But this is where I disagree. I mean, the thing is, I have the same disagreement with Packers fans. Whenever I talk to a Packers fan as a Bears fan, I think it always starts out and I think we have more in common than we think. And then, <laughs> then afterwards I say, no. Um, <laughs> and here's my, here's my problem with it. And that is uh, Barack Obama invoked as sweeping a claim of executive privilege as Donald Trump did. And it went to a district court, and the judge in that case not only slammed Obama, but said, if I was to accept your argument of executive privilege, we would do away with the separation of powers. That was Barack Obama. Bill Clinton made an argument that was breathtakingly broad. And by the way, the argument being raised by Trump against the the subpoenas, I disagree with. I am no fan of the Office of Legal Counsel. I've never been a fan of the Office of Legal George Counsel. George W. Bush made very right. sweeping points as well. But if you look at that letter, they cited the identical position that they raised with the, with the Congress was raised by the Obama administration, was raised by the Clinton administration. So where Claire and I agree is that we, neither of us particularly likes this situation with executive privilege, right. and both of us are critics of executive power. But I think it is, it is gilding the lily a bit to suggest that Trump is way off the charts. He's not. That's the problem, is that we, the presidents have been making these arguments, but we judge them how, by how we feel about the presidents. Right, well, Barack Obama yeah. was breathtaking in his yeah, claims. Actually, I, on that, I actually have to agree with you yeah. uh, on Barack Obama. And the, okay, and then the, now let's finish. <laughs> <laughs> and the, sit down, sit down. And the sovereignty, <laughs> uh, sovereignty, and the new executive authority volume that you mentioned. I started that under Obama mm. because I was so concerned about expansion of executive power. Yeah. This started under Bush after 9-11, and this is sort of the post-9-11 security state. The Office of Legal Counsel has been more responsible, I think, than any other group of lawyers in handing presidents repeatedly, whether they're Republican or Democrats, a basis for expanding executive power to the point where under Bush, the Office of Legal Counsel and my former colleague, John Yoo, trotted out the theory of executive authority to justify the use of torture, mm -hmm. uh, the unitary executive. Um, and so we have seen the steady increase, just as you said, like a gas yeah. in, the, in the theory of executive authority. And that has to be pushed back at. This is sort of the limiting case of it. Can a president actually assert executive privilege in an impeachment mm -hmm. proceeding where Congress's power is at its height? Mm -hmm. And the president's power should be as low as possible relative to Congress's power. And still, the Republicans are willing to say in that context, which I think is entirely wrong, that, ex that executive privilege still has a role to play in blocking uh, witnesses to come forward to testify in an inquiry into the president's own misdeeds. See, that's the Packers problem. I was with you all the way to the last two sentences. <laughs> I had a feeling. I, because the Supreme Court has said executive privilege can be raised. Every press pres past president, Democrat or Republican, have taken that position. And it also makes sense. I'm not a fan of executive privilege, but when you are bringing, asking to bring in the national security advisor to talk about communications with a foreign leader on a subject of this sensitivity, it screams executive privilege. I would adopt a really narrow view of executive privilege. I would reject that wait, wait, claim. Wait, what's the security interest in keeping witnesses who know about the president's misdeeds from coming in to testify? That, where it's not classified. If it is classified, it's a total abuse of that I don't uh, think it is. concept. Look, there's it's not classification. Where's the security? We only interest? disagree. I would. I look. I just said I would rule that. 
that Bolton has to testify. But I would limit the testimony. There's going to be stuff in his testimony that I can promise you the, the federal courts would say is protected by executive privilege. I am 100% certain of that. Uh, you know, there's going to be issues related to Russia and Ukraine in discussion with the president that I think federal judges would say, you know what, that's not for public testimony, even in impeachment. But I believe that the court would have said, but you can answer questions about the quid pro quo. You can answer questions about the relationship with Biden, because as you say, that is out. But there's going to be stuff in there that I think every court w level would say was executive privilege. Could I, could I just- uh, um, We gotta let our I, moderator no, yeah, yeah, in edgewise yeah, here. Yeah, on the potted plant. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to shift gears ever so slightly and ask you both a civic question. Um, one of the things my students and I hope for, even if the, uh, if the conclusion was foregone that uh, that President Trump was not going to be acquitted, uh, not going to be convicted, excuse me, uh, was that, there, that the, the impeachment episode, the, the House investigation, the Senate trial, would take the American people to school on some of these dangerous, uh, um, um, uh, these, these dangerous trends of executive power that you've uh, both mentioned, these long festering problems that seem to have come to a very dangerous culmination with the Trump presidency, but very quickly, and I guess this was somewhat predictable, it all deteriorated into a kind of a partisan theater. Uh, and, and, uh, it, and what we hoped would be a kind of serious debate uh, about witnesses or otherwise, uh, really broke down uh, in, into kind of um, uh, partisan uh, commitments and, and partisan loyalties and partisan strategies. So it seems contrary to what Madison hoped, uh, institutional loyalties have been displaced to a dangerous degree by partisan loyalties. And I wonder if you would both comment on why you think this has happened uh, and whether you see uh, uh, things worse now than they were with, with the previous impeachment episodes of Johnson uh, and, 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 um, and Clinton. And maybe you could talk about Nixon. So uh, I'll start yeah, with you, yeah. Claire. Well, actually, one of the moving things to me is if you watch Nixon's resignation speech, um, you know, he was never uh, fully willing to admit that he had done wrong. But in the resignation speech, he said, it is for the good of the country that I resign. Now, let's be fair, of course, a group of senators had come to him and said, you know, you're not gonna win this one. But, but still, there was a little bit of humility in that speech, and I think he actually did have in mind that it was better for the country for him not to bring uh, our government and our, and our um, entire public through uh, br the bruising battle mm -hmm. that, that would have occurred. Can you imagine President Trump mm -hmm. making a speech like that? Ever even saying, this is for the good of the country, right? So we have had a total decline of um, civic commitment, a total decline in the sense that I put country before party. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? I think. Um, again, I trace a lot to um, what happened in the aftermath of 9-11. There was so much fear that the sort of expansion of the security state um, really shifted the dynamics and the politics around this. Because I think that um, with the expansion of executive authority came a kind of willingness to distort fundamental tenets of our democracy. So the arguments used to justify the torture program were really arguments that distorted law and distorted basic principles of separation of power uh, and balance of power. And those are different concepts, mm -hmm. right? You can believe in separation of powers and still not think that the branches should serve as a check on one another. Um, so I think you know, the country is in a dangerous place right now, uh, even putting this president aside because there is no longer a sense, uh, and among young people, you absolutely see this, um, that there are basic uh, pillars of our democracy that they have to understand and that they have to defend. And that really was the reason mm. for my starting the, the center that I did. Mm. Jonathan, I, um, I wanted to ask you a different, uh, a slightly okay, different. Can I just follow up a little oh, slight on that one? Of course. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm all in on blaming young people. <laughs> I, um, I think there all, are a few of them. All, all problems can be traced back to young people. <laughs> I, but I just want to make one historical point, and that is we often view the problems that we face as worse than anything a past generation mm. has faced. The fact is that the U.S. Constitution was not just written for times like these, it was written during a time like this. You know, um, 
the, the Jeffersonians and the Federalists uh, were as, if not more, uh, um, vicious uh, than, than we have today. I mean, Jefferson referred to the previous Federalism administration of John Adams as the reign of the witches. And when when uh, you know members today say, "Well, you know what? It's just a shame. We, it sounds like we're trying to kill each other." They were actually trying to kill each other. Um, <laughs> that's what the <laughs> Alien and duels, Sedition right? Act. Well, the <laughs> Alien Sedition Act was an effort to kill people you disagreed with. So um, it's not that uh, that is, is is very different. I think that the one thing I agree with in, in terms of what Claire said, and this sort of goes to my other uh, job, which is the thing that's changed is that we are we are increasingly siloed in the news that we receive. And one of the reasons I think people are so angry is that they're so used to being in echo journalism. They go to MSNBC and CNN and hear exactly what they want to hear about Trump, or they go to Fox and hear exactly what they want to hear, and they stay within those silos. And then some event happens where suddenly they're forced to hear opposing views, and it makes them very, very angry. And we do have to resolve somehow how we get back to having a dialogue. I think we are a nation of chumps. I think that the two parties are playing the, this country as chumps, and we're buying it. You know? and, um, and partially it's because everything now is so siloed, you can get away with it. Um, and I think that's adding to the anger. I mean, the death threats that we received, like I said, are similar to what we had with Clinton. But there was a, a depth and a rage to it that I don't remember from Clinton. Um, well, and, and then add to that the ad hominem nature of the news, right? So, yeah. so we no longer talk about institutions. We need to focus on the institution of the presidency, the institution of the Justice Department, the you know, intelligence community. And, and the trouble is that this president has really contributed uh, and here I am, of course, making an ad hominem, hominem remark <laughs> while I say this. But he has contributed to this by attacking individuals repeatedly mm -hmm. rather than looking at structure and principle. And that's the example that our young people are getting. They say, you know, the kind, the, to be up in politics these days means to know the misdeeds of all the individuals mm -hmm. in the opposing party. Yeah. That's not politics. Right? That's just mudslinging. Yeah. So we need to educate our young people in understanding what is the purpose of having a justice department. Why is it so critical that that department be, have a certain amount of independence from the White House, even though it's within a single branch of government? What are the ethical principles that that independence is founded on, and how do you carry those out? Yeah. We don't talk that way mm -hmm. anymore. You know, um, I, I agree with you about the problems of the pres presidency, but Congress is no bargain either. And, and so uh, one, one of the things that, I mean, the, the, when you read about the, uh, the, the framers' discussion of impeachment, uh, they knew impeachment was going to be a political partisan affair because this is the nuclear option uh, uh, again, uh, 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 directed against the presidency. But as, as Hamilton, the hip-hop star, <laughs> says in Federal 65, there would be harsh partisan uh, conflict in the House. We know that. But we've, we're gambling on the Senate um, providing uh, a, a more perspective, being able to transcend the mischiefs of faction more than the House could, particularly since we're going to um, uh, write into the Constitution that the Chief Justice is to preside and each senator is to take a solemn oath. Uh, and so one of the things I wanted to ask you both about is what's happened to the Senate? I mean, you, you mentioned about, uh, you made a distinction between uh, the, the way we should understand Nixon and Trump, well, we should look at the difference between Howard Baker yeah. and, 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 and McConnell. Yeah. Um, so why, what has happened to the Senate as kind of an institution that was supposed to provide a, a broader sense, uh, a, the broader sense of responsibility, right. as Madison says in, in the Federalist 63? Well, again, uh, uh, what, happened, what has happened to it? Sid, looking at this institutionally, um, I believe that the expansion in executive power has gone along with uh, increasing quiescence on the part of the other two branches, right? So if you just look at it from a bird's eye point of view over time, um, and that the court has increasingly made use of doctrines that would require it to step back and not get involved. Um, so to hear that, for example, um, an American who believes he is on the targeted killing list can't come into court and assert his due process rights 
and say, hey, you court have to tell me whether or not this violates my due process rights, mm -hmm. right? And the court says, political question, we can't get involved. So the increasing use of the political questions doctrine uh, is what has the court stepping back. And we look on the side of Congress, there's something kind of similar going on, which is, again, especially post 9-11, uh, a total deferring on the part of Congress to the president and saying, uh, you know what, even though according to the Constitution, our Article I powers say that we're the only branch of government that can declare war, Instead, what do we do? We hand the president a blank check, the AUM 2001 AUMF, followed by the 2002 AUMF. We put no end date on that, and we just, we just hand the president a blank check. And he can do whatever he wants, and Congress will just sit back and let him do it. Yeah. So that's the larger context. And then we have people like Mitch McConnell who have tied their political fortunes to this president. Uh, it is incredibly disturbing that where there is formal separation of powers, that the um, branch of government that's supposed to act as a check on the president has completely abandoned that role and is willing to abandon its power in favor of, of the president. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's really changed from the, the battle between the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians is how much stronger the presidency has, has become, and also the way presidents dominate their party. That's right. Uh, Hamilton, the way, the yeah. way Je Trump has been able to hijack the Republican yeah, Party. Hamilton's too. supposed to be the big pro-executive uh, authority guy, but when you read him, he looks mild by yeah. comparison yeah. with what's going uh, on I now. Mean, there was a debate about Washington issuing a neutrality proclamation, which seemed pretty right. benign right. <laughs> right. <laughs> given, given, given a, a right. current circumstance That's with right. the presidency. you have any comments on the, on the Senate or the uh, Congress? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, and again, Claire and I will disagree. Um, God, the, I couldn't have written the script for this anymore. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, my answer will probably insult everyone in the room uh, if, if, if I work hard enough. Please don't leave. I, the, um, you know what? I hear all the time. What uh, the biggest shame. It's sort of false neutrality. The biggest shame of this process is what we found how biased and partisan the Senate proved. Really? The House, you know, it, 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 the Democrats as a whole, with a couple of defectors, voted to impeach this president, a couple of, of defects, and then the Republicans voted against it. Does that make, but somehow the Republicans are the ones who are blinded by party, the House Democrats were not, the Senate Democrats voted in block to convict the president, but it was the Republicans that are blinded by party, by party, not the Democrats. In the Clinton impeachment that I was involved in, the Democrats voted in block to have no witnesses. They voted in block to have no trial. They wanted to just vote an acquittal for, for Bill Clinton. They voted as a block. Never in history has a single Democrat ever voted against a member of their own party as a president. The Republicans can say they've had a few defections, but not many. So you have to forgive me if I'm not persuaded by the sort of revulsion you express for partisanship. I see partisanship on both sides. Now second, in terms of, of the Senate, has it changed? Yeah and, and, and no. They were, they were my jury in the Porteous impeachment. And I got to tell you, they were the worst jury you could ever have, are those hundred senators. It was like arguing a maritime case to the Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, half of the, you know, some of the senators I was arguing to, and I mentioned this to Adam Schiff when we were about to start our arguments. I said, does it bother you that three of our jurors are under criminal investigation? <laughs> um, so you would have struck all these people for cause in a normal trial. And so, no, there hasn't, in my view, been a dramatic decrease in the quality of senators. But I will agree in one sense with, uh, with Claire, and that is, I think that the nature of our politicians have changed a bit. And I think that this is what Claire was getting at, and I agree with her, that there were times when we had towering figures in Congress that aren't there anymore. You know, during the Porteous impeachment, they had to take a break in the middle of our arguments. And uh, anyway, was, 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 the, uh, uh, was the chief judge. And I, I loved Inouye. Uh, Dan Inouye was just an amazing human being. 
And he came down and he was very nice. And, and he said, what is it like to try a case here in the, on the Senate floor? And I said, you know, I don't really, it's weird. It's very small, it's a rare jury. But I said, what I can't get out of my mind is I was a congressional page at age 15. And I said, I remember coming onto this floor and seeing giants, Javits, Humphrey, you know, seeing true giants. And I said, I just can't, when I look out and argue to this jury, they all seem so damn small, every one of them. And it was the only time I ever saw Dan Inouye look sad. He was a very, very up positive person. And he just said, I think about that every time I come onto the floor. And I think that it has changed. The people, they're more vicious. They're sort of independent contractors. But in many ways, they're just a reflection of our time. We're more vicious. Let's not, uh, let's not forgive ourselves. We're more vicious. We're living in an age of rage because people like being enraged. We, don't, we, don't, we love to blame others, but people are addicted to rage. And you can turn on the cable television, see it all the time. So of course we have politicians like this, because they're the ones that reflect us. Clara, I wanted um, <coughs> to ask you a version of this question of the, this issue that Jonathan raised about that both parties are complicit in the kind of rage we're experiencing right now. And I, I, I just thought you might reflect on the 2020 election yeah. for a moment and what, what you think the consequences of that might be well, for constitutionalism. I, look, um, the amazing thing about this Congress is that, for example, when it came out that Devin Nunes was actually involved in the Ukraine issue and what had a sort of back door open to the White House, um, you realize, and, and that that was a one day news story and it's over. Now, how many of the senators have a situation like this? I got to say, this will be very inflammatory. I, I can oh, already good. hear uh, Jonathan. <laughs> Turn up the mic. <laughs> right. How many of them are either um, indirectly or even directly receiving Russian support? How many of them? Right. The NR. How many of them receive NRA support? And the story about the NRA receiving <laughs> Russian money. Right. That again. That was sort of a two-day news cycle. So. Um, where is, it, it's to me more about corruption um, uh, and what we see is the traditional lines of separation and balance of power have completely broken down in favor of a, of a kind of deep corruption of our politics. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm most concerned about and that that corruption fails to cause shock at this mm -hmm. point. So I really see it in kind of directly moral terms. Uh, and uh, increasingly with this president, what we find is um, that particularly, I believe, the Republicans who are supposed to be representing the country are representing this president. We find, and, and, that, and that they are, they are there to in effect destroy the independence of the, open it up for questions of the Congress. Time and that each of the heads of the various agencies are put there to destroy the traditional function of that agency, right? So now we have a head of the office of the Directorate of National Intelligence, though an acting head, Grinnell, um, who was really put there to destroy the faith that we can have in our intelligence community, right? It is sort of the destruction of our traditional functions in government and, and a rewarding of corruption in this government. Let me, let me push you uh, on this a little bit more because it seems to me you might also really be concerned about the bipartisan commitment to presidential power. Yeah. So when you look at the I Democratic know. candidates and what they're talking about doing unilaterally on the first day, let alone during their first term, and I just went through mm -hmm. an elaborate report that the Sanders campaign has prepared about what they're going to do yeah. the first day, including uh, an emer declare emergency on things like climate change, yeah. uh, um, um, and put an end to um, um, student debt unilaterally. Uh, uh, is, is, is there much hope that if the Democrats win the election, there, there would be, as some of my colleagues hope, guardrails restored to constrain the presidency? Or is it the case now that both parties embrace presidential power uh, with a considerable degree of eagerness? 
So we're in a right. real conundrum now. That is a really wonderful question, and, and it is what I am looking for in, in the upcoming primaries. I am really concerned about Bernie Sanders as a candidate because I think he doesn't understand those guardrails. I don't think that he is concerned about restoring the balance of power between the Senate and, and uh, the presidency. Um, I don't hear him talking that way, right? So, so the idea of declaring an emergency over climate change, while I believe that in a broader sense it is an international emergency, that's not what presidential emergency powers are for. The abuse of presidential power has often come in the form of declaring emergencies. Uh, and indeed, all the way back to Lincoln suspending the writ of habeas corpus, uh, while presumably he had you know, as good grounds as any president, the court actually back then in a case called Ex Party Merriman was willing to say, this is not an appropriate use of presidential power, right? And, and Lincoln's there saying, but it's an emergency. I think watch out whenever presidents are saying, but it's an emergency, because the whole point of that uh, in general is to bypass the checks and balances. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. So um, you've been waiting patiently. A uh, little booze, but <laughs> for the most part, waiting patiently. So we're going to open up for questions now. Uh, we have people here with mics. We have uh, someone there in the back. Uh, so if you'll raise your hand, I'll recognize you if I can see you through these lights. And wait for the mic to get to you. Sir, we'll start with you right here. Uh, um, hi, my name is Mike Stern. I used to work in the House Counsel's Office. I, I would like to push back a little bit on the issue of how you would resolve these subpoena cases in any kind of reasonable time. Uh, the McGann case, which you mentioned, which is still active, is was filed in August. It's right now sitting at the D.C. Circuit. <clears throat> it would still have to go up to the uh, Supreme Court presumably to get any kind of final ruling. And that's only the issue of whether he needs to show up. It doesn't deal with any of these questions about what questions he has to answer. So I don't see, I don't, I, I'd like to hear your theory as to how they could have gotten any kind of useful information within a reasonable period of time. I, I'd be happy to, to start. The, first of all, um, the reason that McGann took so long uh, is that uh, I testified, I think, in the last uh, 18 months, I probably testified four or five times. And every single time I was from the House Judiciary, I asked why they weren't moving on impeachment. Uh, just as someone who represented the House of Representatives during the health care stuff, um, I was completely baffled why they would be proceeding on McGahn and other witnesses as an oversight matter. That's the difference, is they went forward on oversight and they said, we want this person to testify. McGahn occurred before the vote on impeachment. They waited to impeach, to have an impeachment inquiry months after they said they were doing an impeachment inquiry. And many of us said, why are you doing that? You could, Nancy Pelosi held a press conference and said, we are now in an impeachment inquiry. What? Is that all that it takes, is you have a press conference and you say from the head of Zeus, here comes an impeachment inquiry? You have a vote, that's what happened before, and judges take note of it. Now it is true, and I think you're absolutely correct, that um, this would go up to the Supreme Court, there would still be questions about specific questions. But if you look at what happened with Nixon, that was three, a three month process, and they got an answer from the Supreme Court. Also, you don't know what John Bolton would have done. John Bolton and his aides said they wanted a subpoena because they felt that they needed cover because they were disagreeing with the White House. Right. They both said that if they were subpoenaed, it would change their position because they would be forced to testify. Mm -hmm. When the House took his aide, mm -hmm. actually gave a subpoena to his aide, they went and, and the aide went and, and challenged it in court to get a review of the court. The House of Representatives withdrew the subpoena and the judge in that case I gotta tell you, it seemed pretty clear that he was absolutely astonished. And he simply said, the House Representative clearly has no interest in this witness because he was preparing to answer the question. Why? So when you say, well, look, it would take too much time, they wouldn't get it, I'm a litigator. Why wouldn't you get it into the system? Why wouldn't you try? 
If you run out of runway, you haven't lost anything, why wouldn't you subpoena them, get them in the pipeline, and see where you are? In April or March, if you still haven't had the witnesses, what you will have is a series of court orders supporting your obstruction claim. Right. So that's why? What, that's what I agree with. That's what I agree with. Now, except um, I do think that the House would have been in a much stronger position during an impeachment inquiry um, to pursue those witnesses and to, and to force the court to hurry up, right? This is, this is a situation, um, you know, judge, where we have an ongoing impeachment inquiry, hurry up and decide this case because this witness has to testify. Um, now, continuing to pursue the McGahn case after the uh, president has been acquitted is going to particularly slow down the process. I was convinced from the beginning, uh, so this is the piece where I agree with Jonathan, that if those core witnesses were not called either in the House or the Senate, that the president would not be removed. So I think there was no point in failing to pursue, despite the difficulties that you correctly raise, in failing to pursue those subpoenas uh, and to have the showdown with these claims of executive privilege that our system really needs to have to clarify this issue. So do you think if you, you had had witnesses that more Republicans would have voted I do. to convict? I do. Even I though Mitt Romney is the only senator in history to vote yeah. to, to I, convict I, a member of his own party? I think, I think this is where the bias comes in. You know, of course, all the Republicans are robotic, blind, vicious members and the Democrats, yeah, they voted in block, but they were actually considering acquitting the president. <laughs> I, the, I spoke to all the Republican senators after the House vote, and um, I was astonished uh, by w the questions I received uh, and um, the serious questions uh, that involved the process. Mm. Um, there were more Republicans than people suggest that were willing to consider this case. I, um, I can tell you that for a fact, and many of them continued to call me during the trial. They were bothered by how this all played out. They were also honestly angry with the, how the House handled it. They honestly, and I think correctly, felt this was a rushed impeachment. It, it was, they did not do what they were supposed to do in terms of preparing the record. But this is where I think Claire and I agree. What was certain is that if you push the vote by Christmas, it would be a failure. That was certain. Mm -hmm. What was certain is that if you just litigated some of these issues for a couple of months, your case could only have been stronger, particularly on the obstruction article. Or, or you know. weaker, but then you better face that now. Yeah, I just think right? they would have That's prevailed right. If on the courts things, were not yeah. willing to say these witnesses have to come in and testify, that tells us something important about where we are yeah. mm -hmm. in this country, right? That, that they would be willing to uphold the president's obstruction judicially, and it would have been overturning important and precedents like U.S. v. Nixon. And by, and by right? the way, even if you didn't change the, the votes of those Republicans, it would have made it a harder vote for them. That is, if you yes. put that evidence in front of it, it would have isolated them more. The, the House Democrats could not have made this easier for the White House and, and for the members of, that, of the Senate. They could not have made it easier. I, I actually believe that if John Bolton had testified um, say, in the Senate, Mitt Romney would not have been alone on that vote. Well, I can tell you there was, uh, there was a number of senators that were seriously in play, more than people have suggested. I can tell you that for certain because I've talked to them. Fascinating. Sir, then I'll come over. Come, come over to the left here. Uh, uh, James Heffernan, just a, an academic, uh, nothing to do with politics. <laughs> just an academic? Except as an observer. You've got to have uh, a little more pride in being an academic. Sorry. <laughs> 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 so, uh, before the Senate trial of the President, every single senator took an oath to do impartial justice. I think the Schiff and his colleagues demonstrated that in every other impeachment trial of judges, including presidents, there had been new evidence, new witnesses presented, regardless of what the House had done beforehand. Given those two facts, is it not self-evident that you cannot do impartial justice without calling for witnesses, and therefore would not Justice Roberts have been perfectly justified in calling those witnesses, exercising his prerogative as the presiding officer at that trial? Good question. Uh, the answer, I think, is, uh, maybe I'll go in reverse order. In terms of the Chief Justice's role, 
Uh, we don't have a lot to go on, right? This is the easiest course to teach. You've got, it's, it's a course with precedent of two cases. Uh, and maybe 2.5 if you include Nixon. Uh, the, and it, it, the two cases have vastly different models of the Chief Justice. Uh, because uh, Rehnquist, as you know, uh, quoted Gilbert and Sullivan that basically said, you know, he did nothing, but he did that quite well. <laughs> uh, and he really uh, relished the point of, of having uh, sort of a low impact, low role in, in the process. Uh, Chase was as different as you could be. Chase maintained that not only could he vote on evidentiary questions, but he could vote on the ultimate merits because he was a member of the Senate. Uh, be, uh, by the language of impeachment. He's he was absolutely wrong. And, and at that time, a senator stood up and, and put, in a mo put forward a motion saying, you're not a member of the Senate. You can't vote on the merits if it's a tie. He did vote on a couple of evidentiary questions that were ties. I, I am pretty certain that Roberts, if the question was presented to him, would have declined. And I think that he would have been right because the Senate has always determined the evidence and witnesses that would be, would be brought before them. Um, even if he ruled against them, they could overrule him by majority vote. Now getting to your first point, which is also I think a salient one and one which I'm going to have some disagreement with, is um, once again, uh, I, I, I supported the calling of witnesses even though I believe the House blundered this case. But I, st but I, I still maintained that y y this issue is what the Senate's responsibility was. In my view, the House blew its responsibility. And I can understand the anger of the Senators with what was presented to the House, from the House. But that doesn't relieve the obligation of the Senate. I think that the House managers have a right to present a case with witnesses. I will note that in Clinton, they, they, the Democrats took the opposite position. They voted against witnesses, and they, they voted against a trial. Okay? Putting, but the, you, Capitol Hill has always floated on a sea of hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, so let's get to this issue in terms of witnesses. Even on the issue of witnesses, I thought the Democrats were, hip, were hypocritical. They were right that, they sh that Schiff should have gotten witnesses. But you'll notice that they would say, you know what, it, it, absolutely we should get the witnesses we called, these four witnesses. And then when the Republicans said we would like to call uh, Hunter Biden, for example, they said absolutely not. Okay? You can, the witnesses you're citing are absolutely outrageous. Now this is showing my bias as a criminal defense attorney. Hunter Biden was a material witness. There would not have been a judge in a regular case that would have spent more than five seconds in approving his being called. And what Schiff was saying was nonsense about Hunter Biden. He was saying, look, Hunter Biden's not relevant because it doesn't go to our theory of whether the quid pro quo was tied to the election. He's totally relevant. Well, yeah, that's why he's a defense witness. He's relevant to the defense. Now, whether you believe the president or not, the president is saying he was worried about corruption. Now, you might not agree with that. That's his defense. Well, wait a second, Jonathan. You can't say that even if the Bidens were corrupt, that it's okay for a president to ask a foreign leader to investigate an American citizen. I mean, really, I understand the defense's theory, but they didn't even really make that argument. And you know what? The I, Republicans had the majority in the Senate. If they wanted to call Hunter Biden, there would have been no problem. They could have voted it. Well, I know. They did not what want I'm to hear from Hunter Biden. But what I'm saying is the hypocrisy of the position of the Democrats. No, what that if they were going to look, if they called witness, Hunter Biden would have been called. But I want to get to, I want to get to the merits of it for for a second, and that is, and this may be criminal defense attorney coming out again, but. He's allowed to present his defense. The position of the, of the president was that the Hunter Biden contract was a, an example of the ongoing corruption in Ukraine. It is relevant to note that the Hunter Biden contract was still ongoing during the Trump administration. It ended shortly before uh, this dispute occurred. This was not some ancient issue. The second point to note about Hunter Biden is it was corrupt. Okay, the Hunter Biden contract was the embodiment of corruption in politics. And I can say this because 30 years ago, I wrote my first column about this form of corruption, about giving the children and spouses of members and executive branch officials windfall deals 30 years ago. 
is this is the, the most serious form of corruption we have in Washington. It is legalized bribery. I can't go to Biden and say, here's a million dollars, we both end up in jail. But I can go to his Dunsky son and I can give a million dollars to him and it's totally legal. So why in 30 years haven't they tried to close that loophole? Because they all yeah, want but, it. But how does that make Hunter Biden relevant to the argument? Because Again, if the Republicans thought we need to clear the president's intentions here by bringing in witnesses who can demonstrate the corruption. They could, there, not only could they have called Hunter Biden, they could have called Joe Biden, they could have called a bunch of administration witnesses like Mick Mulvaney, right? Why was Mick Mulvaney a, a Democratic witnesses? Why weren't the Republicans saying, let's get Mick Mulvaney in here to clear the president, well, see, the, the right? The difference clear is I call them all and let God sort so, them out. Go to your corner. I have, I have no, I have no <laughs> problem. I want to let another question get in here. Yes, sir. <laughs> Wait, wait for the mic, sir. We have a question from a student. Uh, is yeah. that okay? Yes, but I don't Absolutely. Keep that one down. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us your wheels. My question is that um, my understanding, which is you know, which can be totally wrong, that there are two parts of the impeachment. One is the constitutional aspect, which is what you guys have been talking about. And the other part is the practical and political aspect of it. Like, what would you get out of this impeachment? So a lot of people are saying the Democrats are pushing this forward in a, such a short time period, is that they knew that the Republican control Senate will never convict the president, no matter how much evidence you're presenting to them. And um, part of that argument is that senators, even though they should be impartial jurors, they are bounded to their constituents. And a lot of the Republican senators' constituents are fervent supporters of the president. And given that, no matter how strong the case the Democrats can, can build, no matter how bountiful, bountiful like the evidence you can show to the constituents, a lot of them would not admit the president has done anything wrong. I was um, interning in the House during the impeachment, during the winter break, and I was talking to a lot of Republican and Democrat staffers because I want to know both sides of the argument. And a lot of them, both sides of the aisle, have mentioned to me that they believe um, because the Trump administration has so many like scandals every other day, you know, and you, for the public, it's really confusing. You know, is, is it really bad for the president to pay a porn star that much money? Is that illegal? And is it wrong for the president to, to pick up the phone and talk to, you know, president of a foreign country? Because you have so much going on that the public, it's really hard for them to tell, oh, what is actually constitu constitutionally wrong? It's hard for the senators to decide, let alone the public. So what do you think? Um, like the true point of this impeachment is like, like should it be purely about fulfilling Congress constitutional du duty on check and balance, or should it be also about you know making sure that we can come with this president, which will not be possible? You know what I mean? Like there are two parts of it, and 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 kind of goes on to explain why the Democrats are trying to push this so fast. Like, what, what's your opinion on that? Thank you so much. Yeah, so, so uh, as I've already said, I believe that the most important thing to focus on is not the person, but the institution. Um, and I hope that one thing that could come out of this failed process, and I think sort of failed on all sides, um, is that there may be some uh, movement, bipartisan movement, to reform the impeachment process. For example, it would make a lot of sense, and I think a lot of sense going forward for both parties, to revise the Senate rules to say the Senate must call witnesses. And that each side gets you know, so many witnesses. Each side gets five witnesses. It's a very strange process because it's sort of like a trial and it's sort of not. To make a real trial make sense, you have background rules that the jurors themselves don't select and the parties themselves don't select. You have rules of evidence. Here we have no rules of evidence, right? You have rules about notification of witnesses and whether you could call them, whether you have a right to call them. So here we have a very, very strange process in which the Senate is both the uh, defense or, or in some cases could be prosecution team and they're the jurors 
and they're sort of the judge making up the rules as they go along. This is where I think in, in response to the previous question, Robert absolutely could have and should have played a more active role. I don't think he should be voting, uh, you know, as, as Chase um, might have said, on the substance of the charges, but he should have weighed in and said, hey, these witnesses are relevant, let's hear them. But that's all we've got as far as an objective structure uh, for supplying rules that both parties can live with. So I hope that we will see some kind of impeachment reform in the future. Uh, where I would disagree with your, your first premise is um, this is an excuse being, being used by the Democrats for a bungled impeachment. Uh, they could have made this much tougher on the Republicans in the White House. And so the excuse is, you know what, they would never have voted to convict. Really? Because it would have been a tougher vote. You made it easy by leaving it up to them whether they would call direct witnesses. You would have made it a tougher vote if you had added judges who were saying you are obstructing Congress. You would have made it a tougher vote to see, for example, we knew that, that Bolton's book was coming out in March. Even if you didn't get Bolton, you'd probably get his book. You know, but even if that didn't happen, it could only make the vote more difficult. Now, historically, it is not true. Historically, the parties tend to vote for the president uh, uh, or against the president, depending upon, upon party. But there are, of course, historic uh, departures from that, and the most famous being in the Johnson case. The Johnson case was an abomination. Um, it was a trapdoor impeachment. They created a crime that they knew that Johnson would trigger. They even called it a high misdemeanor in the statute. It was just basically a, a, a neon sign saying trip impeachment here because they knew that Johnson would do it. And he did it. He knew he was violating law. It was a crime. So there was no question of whether it was a crime. The Supreme Court later said that law was clearly unconstitutional and it was clearly unconstitutional. Um, but when it came to a final vote, seven so-called radical Republicans voted in favor of acquittal of a president they despised. And they did it out of conscience because there wasn't, they didn't have any choice. The unconstitutionality of the statute was standing, staring them straight in the face. And one of those senators, Ross from Kansas, later said that it was like looking into my open grave and jumping. And virtually all of them were not reelected. Uh, they did suffer uh, the consequences. So what I would suggest to you is, all I knew when I testified was that they were going to have a colossal failure and make this easy on the White House. That's all I knew. And um, I think history will, show, will, will share that judgment that this was a colossal blunder. And I think the White House, history will not be kind. When they built their case around uh, uh, Dershowitz's theory, History will not know what the senators voted on, whether any of them voted on the basis of a clearly discredited theory, or whether they voted because they felt that there was not evidence of impeachment. So I think both sides blundered in historic ways. Here, Jonathan, I just have to state one disagreement, which is I think that while there may be senators in the Republican Party who are, who are willing uh, to be more independent-minded, um, I think the way Mitch McConnell has run the Senate, his party in the Senate, um, there, there is no open-mindedness. So the only question is whether or not Mitch McConnell was gonna prevail or whether or not the balance of power with more witnesses could have shifted to more moderate Republicans in the House. Can I ask one question, though, Claire? Can I ask one question? Do you honestly think that Elizabeth Warren would ever have voted for acquittal? If they had produced Trump's evil twin who took <laughs> responsibility for the phone call, do you think that even if that twin came and testified that Elizabeth Warren would say, acquittal, please? I mean, it, the Democratic... I, I think Elizabeth Warren's maybe a bad example because I actually think I actually think that she's one of the few senators who actually read the Mueller report and is actually going by evidence. So I think um, 
I, I grant some of what you say about the Democratic Party. I absolutely think that the parties are locked in, but um, I, I, I do think that there is a, um, another side, another tradition that moving to the evidence. The trouble was that the Republicans were determined that there would be no evidence. And when you said earlier uh, there were no witnesses, there were 12 witnesses in the House, right? So in fact, there were witnesses and I do think- They're not the right ones. And I, uh, well, they were the right ones, but they weren't enough of the right ones, right? And so I do think that um, there is a cadre of moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans who actually are moved by evidence and are willing to listen. But the party um, leaders, especially in the case, case of Mitch McConnell, is, uh, are determined to shut down any kind of reflection and any kind of real commitment to a fair process. Mm -hmm. That's why I think the process really needs reform. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to, I'm sorry, sir, we're out of time. Uh, do we have to, I'll tell you what, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to, uh, in, this, in this era of executive aggrandizement, <laughs> I'm going to go over time while you ask the question. question. Yeah. I'm old enough to have lived through the Army. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We, since, since I'm breaking I one rule. Recall let, there you go. that after three months of the Army McCarthy hearings, McCarthy was relegated to insulting an associate of Joseph Welch's. My point is that process can trump proceedings gone on longer, either in the House and or in the Senate. The Trumpistas would have been relegated to similarly trivial things and would have exposed themselves in the way that McCarthy did in those hearings. And what we are seeing now is the acolyte of McCarthy using Roy Cohn techniques to accomplish the things that could have been shut down by hearing. I'd just like to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I, really, I really do agree with that. And um, I think, unfortunately, uh, we have a public that is very willing to um, be moved by those kinds of techniques. As Jonathan mentioned, the um, news cycle is so polarized, there's social media. So the real question, I think, is how to start educating the next generation of leaders so that it becomes an embarrassment again to not appear to be fair-minded, right? The, the uh, Republicans in the House were extraordinarily um, vicious and ad hominem in their attacks um, on the witnesses and on the evidence. These basically neutral civil servants coming in and telling uh, things like they saw it and coming reluctantly to the conclusions that they came to. Uh, that doesn't play anymore. The idea that, you know, here are individuals being fair-minded. Here are individuals actually sifting through evidence. Uh, the public doesn't seem to notice that when that happens anymore. So we do have to go back to what, what we are teaching our, our children so that the values uh, of neutrality start to matter again. Yeah, That's where it goes to you, John. Yeah, um, look, I gotta tell you, I, I'm gonna insult people again. Uh, and I'll probably have to be escorted from the building. <laughs> um, spare me the feigned neutrality. Really, the Republicans were vicious? Democrats weren't. Democrats were like Disraeli, every one of them. Uh, you know, they were incredibly discerning and, and even-handed, and they really wanted to get at the truth. And they were, as Nancy Pelosi said, deeply disturbed having to, to impeach this president. We are a nation of chumps, honestly. Really, it was, it was partisan on both sides. I don't think either side was that interested in getting all the evidence. They were interested in getting evidence that would prove their case. But in the House, I was there. I saw a lot of viciousness on both sides. I saw a lot of blind partisanship on both sides. How about this for a possibility? Maybe if the, hearing, if the witnesses were heard, maybe some of the Democratic senators might have considered acquittal. But the fact they that the have. questions yeah. are loaded, it's often sort of, wouldn't time have taken and maybe people would have seen his guilt? There is still a trial here that has to be had. I have been critical of, of Trump. I disagreed with him on this call. I disagreed with the failure to call the witnesses. But I got to tell you, the difference that, that I have with some of these questions is I think both sides were appalling. 
I think they were both vicious. And I don't believe either side was really trying to fulfill fully their constitutional functions. And so I'm sorry, this seems to me to be a movie where everyone comes and just hears the lines they want to hear. And half of the movie goes by without notice. Well, I wish we were ending on a happier note. <laughs> well, well, I, I hope things play out so next time we get together, uh, we'll, have, we'll have more positive things to say about the political process. Thank you all so much for coming. And thanks for you. Thank you, Terry. Thank, Thank you so much. That's great.